I'm gonna start recording. Is this going to YouTube? Uh, maybe. I have a playlist for uh, those that I record. It's not gonna be on YouTube video because I'm lazy. <coughs> but let's try to uh, let's try to understand some stuff today. Mostly, the idea is understanding linear types. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. But it's linear types, borrow checking, uh, why mutable code is faster than immutable code. Um, let's see if there is anything else. No, that's about it. So to start, what is linearity? So whenever we're talking about linear types, we're trying to enforce a property called linearity. Uh, linearity is a very simple property which states that in terms of lambda calculus, um, it essentially says that every variable must be used once. Not zero times, not two times, exactly once. Uh, in general, that means that functions such as this, that this is not Rust, I'm just using for the highlighting. Functions such as these are okay, but this is not okay. Because the variable uh, appears twice, right? More fundamentally, uh, when we are talking about linearity, we are talking about dropping some rules. Okay, uh, in all, in most formal systems, we have three rules called the structural rules. One of them is weakening. Weakening just allows you to have a function that does not use the parameter. So if I have, I don't know, man, I'm, I do not have enough letters. If I have this. This only works because I have weakening, right? I'm not using it, X. X is being used zero times. Uh, the other rule is contraction, which allows me to use the same variable twice. So let me call this weakening, contraction. Here I'm using contraction. The variable appears twice. And uh, by twice, I don't mean like only two times. I mean like any number of times. Because if you double a variable, you can double it again and double it again and double it again. You can have how many copies of the variable you want. And last but not least, we have exchange, which allows you to use variables in different orders. So I can do this, for example. Y was, ju y was just introduced on the scope, uh, but I can, I can use X. Like the order, I can change the order. Exchange is not our focus here. Our focus is on those two. Those are the rules that almost all systems have. Uh, in general, when we're talking about programming languages, we think in terms of the lambda calculus, which is very simple. So the lambda calculus has all those three rules naturally. So you can do x to uh, m, so like n t is a function. You can also just mention a variable, this is a variable. And you can also eliminate a function, which we say it's m, n. Okay, let's go with a JS-like notation. This is Turing complete. That's the lambda calculus. I always introduce it. Uh, to show that it's Turing complete, I can make an infinite loop in JS. Um, you can do x to x. So I call that fix. Uh, I don't need that. I can go, just go here. You can see that maximum calls text size exceeded. So the lambda calculus is Turing complete. It only has a single rule. But the lambda calculus by default allows this. What is the issue with this? The issue here is that whenever you have contraction or exchange, you cannot model resources. Because resources have a very important property, which is they are scarce, right? So if I have a block of gold, I cannot have two blocks of gold. I cannot just duplicate my gold, right? Uh, so whenever I do, x, x plus x. Essentially, I'm duplicating two things. It, imagine like, like you get any resource or any object, physical object, and now, you know, you just get two of those somehow. You know, it doesn't work. It's scarce. You can only use a resource once. But even more important, if you go into a more physics-like deta uh, details, you cannot also use a resource zero times. 
Like if I if I get my phone, I cannot make it disappear. That would be a nice magic trick, but I would I would lose a phone. I can transform it for sure. I can break it. You know, by dropping it, I'm not gonna do that because I'm not. It's already broken, but you know, I I could I could drop it, I could break it, I could burn it, but I could not make the phone disappear. So whenever you want to model resources, you need to have linearity. You need to have this concept of stuff can only be used once. Uh, and be used used only once just means that in some someone somehow somewhere the uh, the object must exist the resource must be there and it must be a single copy uh, that is a thing that you cannot do in most languages you cannot do that in C you cannot do that in OCaml you cannot cannot do that in TypeScript you can almost do that in Rust and so Rust that's the main feature that Rust introduces Rust allows you to manage resources. Uh, technically, Rust does not have what we call a linear type system. It has an affine type system. So when you, you look, we call those substructural type systems. Uh, linear only has exchange. Affine has exchange and weakening. So in Rust, one of the things that you can do is not use a variable. You would be able to do this in Rust. Okay. Uh, that just makes it easier because now you can just ignore something, right? So Rust automatically introduces a free or a close or anything like that for you. So let's go, uh, let's try to understand a bit more of why linearity matters, why modeling resources matter. We, have a, actu we actually have a lot of resources that we try to pretend they don't exist. One of them is memory, okay? So when you're dealing in terms of the Lambda Calculus, which is the case for JavaScript, it's the case for Camel, uh, it's the case for PHP, most languages, almost all of them. When you're dealing in terms of a Lambda Calculus-like semantics, you always pretend that memory is infinite, right? You, you don't think about, oh no, can I allocate this? Do I have enough memory to allocate this? No, you just go there and do it. And you hope that the garbage collector is gonna um, is gonna try to allocate and it's gonna find all uh, and if you do not have enough memory it's gonna uh, collect all the memory so that you can reuse it and whatnot that is cool and all but first that's uh, that is kind of hard to predict because now you have a garbage collector and garbage collection may take minutes if you have a big heap if you have a lot of memory on your program garbage collection may take 10 minutes Right, Java people know that. So we do a lot of tricks to make garbage collection uh, go faster, and especially reduce, reduce the amount of uh, workload per garbage collection so we can have very low latency. But that is not ideal. You're still, you're still handling some stuff in some weird ways. Uh, it would be better if we could just use malloc and free, okay? The issue with malloc and free is what if you forget to use a free? What if you for, forget to, like, what if you do a malloc? Uh, no, yeah, it's, uh, what if you do a free twice, right? So those are two different issues. You can forget to do a free, which means you leak memory. You can also do a free twice. You can also do free and then use the variable afterwards, which is bad. One, uh, and linearity allows us to have malloc and free which are the traditional ways that you allocate memory in C and not suffer any of those issues. Why? Because whenever you, you start treating memory as a resource, now you cannot, you cannot do free twice, right? I cannot do like malloc, I don't know, eight and free of X and free of X. Why? Because the variable appear twice. I cannot do free and try to do reference X. I cannot do like Y this. Why? Because X appears twice. I cannot do, I, I just cannot do this even. I could not do this if I wanted. So because X appears twice. Uh, and this is one usage of resources. That's where, that's how Rust does it. 
I'm going to show some examples of the board checking and whatnot later. But there is also some other resources which are more scarce, and those are bigger problems. For example, file descriptors. On a system like Linux, uh, in general on Unix systems, or POSIX, you may call, you have a thing called a file descriptor. A file descriptor describes a resource in your computer. It may be a socket connection, okay? It may be an actual file, so you open a file. It may be a block of memory, because you can do a map stuff. Is it like this? No, does a map gives me a, an FD? I don't remember. It's been a while. Mm. Yeah, it does. A map gives me an FD. It may be any resource. Any resource that the kernel, kernel manages, it's managed, by, it's managed by a file descriptor. Essentially, a file descriptor is just a pointer to a resource inside, inside of your operating system. What, are the, what is the issue? You cannot have infinite files open. The kernel just doesn't let you do that. You cannot have infinite sockets open. Why? Your network is not going to handle that. Like it may be your operating system, your bandwidth, it may be your, your router. Some stuff is going to fail. So you need to manage those resources with much more, more care. Uh, that's, that's why in languages like Python, we have wit. So in Python, you have the wit statement, which is automatically you're going to open some resources and it's going to automatically close this for you. But that is not safe, by the way. That does not guarantee you. There is still some tricks that you can do to bypass wit in Python. What, do, what we would like is a way to guarantee that no resource is leaked uh, naturally. So like for sure, you can, you can make an array and store all the file descriptors. That's not, that's not a problem. But you know, if you're not doing that, if you're not storing them, you want to guarantee that the file descriptors are all closed. And you can do that with linearity. Because imagine I have a socket. Uh, I have a function which is going to connect and read, OK? And remember, here I'm just using some syntax, but uh, imagine it's not going to be that, that hard. Uh, I do the socket. Uh, well, actually, I'm going to connect, you know, connect to so something. I'm going to read the file descriptor. What is the issue here? The issue here is that read uses the file descriptor, but I did not close the file descriptor. So here I have a message, for example. In general, what we do is we say that if the file descriptor is going to be kept open, I'm going to return a copy. It's the same. So tsfd and tsfd are the same, but I'm going to put a number to make it clear. What, are, what is the issue now? fd1 is not being used. So it's not linear. Uh, what you can do? Let's say I don't want to do anything. I can just close FD1. And now I return my message. That's it. No magic. So what is going on here? What is going on here is that just by ensuring linearity and by making the right APIs, I can guarantee that the file descriptor is going to be open and closed. And uh, let's imagine, you know, we have a net package, a net module. Not going to implement that. And I say that uh, I'm going to go with a socket. I say that socket is a type. Sure. And we have connect. Connect just returns a socket. Uh, read is going to take a socket. And return well, it's going to return the same socket, but also a, a message on a string. And I also have close, which does nothing. By reading this API, I have a guarantee that at no point a socket uh, is going to be kept open if you are not storing it, right? Because I connect to the socket, which gives me a socket. Whenever I try to read a socket, I pass the socket, uh, and it returns me a message, which was the red data. And also, it returns me the same socket again. And whenever I want to discard the socket, I do close. This allows me to model, uh, this allows me to model sockets in, in a way that there is no way 
the T socket is gonna be kept open. After I use it, I must close it or pass it around. Like I must do something with this socket. Uh, here is an example. So imagine if I did not do this, it would, it would give me a type error. And that is essentially uh, the property that borrow checking guarantees you, okay? Borrow checking just allows you to discard that. So whenever you don't, uh, like borrow checking Rust, so whenever you do don't use it, this line is gonna be introduced. So Rust is gonna be like, hey, FD1, sure, not used. So I'm gonna introduce this for you. This also works for other stuff such as arrays and whatnot. Uh, so now let's imagine an array. Okay, I have that array is a type. Well, array is actually a type constructor, right? Uh, let me try to do, yeah, I'm gonna do this, uh, content, it's a type. Um, and so I can create an array, which is gonna be the size, an array of int, let's say. And now operations that I would like to do on an array. I would like to be able to read the data from an array, so I would like to have a get. Uh, here I'm gonna take, uh, in general I do something like this. So the array is gonna be array A. I'm gonna take the, the position, which is a natural number, and, well, I'm gonna return A, right? Uh, if I do a set, I'm gonna take the array, array A, in T8 of net, and I'm gonna, uh, here, I also need to, to get the element A to unit. What is the issue here? Whenever you try to do Let's say I get an array of int. Okay. Whenever I try to get a position, I'm going to pass the array, pass position zero. I cannot do this. Why? Because the array appears twice. So this API is not modeling, is not a proper linear API. Oh, it is linear in the, in the way that Array is always used, but it doesn't give us the design set we want. So what do I do? I return the element here, and I return the new array. And so now I can do array. I'm gonna put a number just to to make everyone's life easier. What is the issue here? The array is still not uh, array two is not being used. So what I can do here, I could have a, a free, for example, that would take the array and it would do nothing. So here we just did, let's say, malloc and free. By doing array.free of array2. And I can return, I don't know, x plus y. That would work. Uh, first, that's not very ergonomic. You can see that array one and array two are being passed around. Um, and sure, we can we can call it the same array. We can you know we can use the same name. It's not an issue. Uh, calling free is also kind of painful. So in general, in something like Rust, we make it a fine. Imagine that Rust is gonna call it for you. But we can never use the same array twice. Why we can never use the same array twice? Because whenever we try to use the same array twice, uh, whenever we try to use the same array twice, what is the issue again? Right. Uh, I may not have, I'm, I cannot know that there is only a single reference. So imagine I could, I could pass the same array to two functions. One function could do a free, and the other could then just, you know, I could do this. For example, what is the issue here? Now array was deallocated and now I'm trying to access the array. That would cause what we call uh, a problem. In general, that's gonna be a seg fault eventually. But that is still not all. Uh, 
how do how does something like REST solves it? What REST does is instead of making everything very explicit, by the way, set should also be should also return array A. Because Okay, because set, you know, you don't consume the array, you get a new one. What would be cool of this is if we had, if we had a more ergonomic way of doing this function. And we do. That's what borrow checking does. When you're talking about borrow checking, essentially we're changing some stuff. Instead of this return being explicit here, I tag it here. I say, hey, this is only getting the copy in an immutable way. Same here. I'm getting the copy in a mutable way. <coughs> we already discussed that free is not needed. So what is this doing? This is doing the same thing as it was doing here. Uh, it's just that right now, I know that this array is not going to be mutated. So I could pass the same array to many functions, many threads and whatnot. So imagine there is uh, two threads running in parallel. Because I know this is not going to be mutable, I could pass it to both because they're just going to read. The other thing that this guarantees me, uh, the other thing that this gives me is a bit more you know, it's a bit more convenient. Now I can just use the same variable many times because I know that this function is returning it back. So those two snippets of code are essentially the same thing. The difference is now this is much more ergonomic. Like it's also much more natural. It feels like writing C code. I personally prefer the first one, and I'm going to explain why later. But this is pretty good, and this is essentially all that there is to board checking. Except that there is some problems uh, that makes it a bit more complex, but that's all that there is to board checking and rest. Essentially, instead of returning a new copy, so every variable can only be used once, or zero in the case of rest, but now we have a couple ways that we can allow a variable to be used many times. But instead of thinking, hey, this variable is being used many times, you can think of like, this function borrows the variable and returns it back. But instead of being part of the return type, it's now an annotation on the parameter. You can think about it as this being sugar do this. But it's a bit more than syntax sugar, but it's still sugar. Now let's go with an example. I used this example a couple, a couple months ago. Uh, Grande is a friend of mine. Uh, and he's a big guy. That's why we call it Grande in Portuguese. His name is Gabriel or Gabriel. Now let's look at some stuff here. Yeah, you are there. Uh, we are never gonna, like we make Grande, okay? And then we pass it to no up one which is a function that does nothing. As soon as this function returns, I can use grande again. No issue. Why? Because you can imagine that no op one returned gr grande to me. So I passed it around and I, it gave me it back. No op two does the same, but instead of taking it as a mutable reference, it takes it as, a, as an immutable reference. Same code still works. I can still mutate grande. I can change his ID. Uh, but same idea, right? At the end, after no op2 is called, it just returns the user back. In this case, good. Now we go to no op3. No op3 is not going to work. Why? Because when I'm doing this, no op3 uh, no op is actually getting the copy and there is no borrow. It's just getting the user and that's it. It's there. I cannot assign the ID to Grande. I cannot even return Grande because the value was moved. The value is now part of, of no op3. It was never given me back. It was just, you know, I take a box 
and I don't give you back. You cannot use the box. It's not in your hands. Uh, and so this is already one interesting case. But now let's try to change this case a bit. What if no op three, now called no op four, return the variable? Now the code works again. Because this would be the same as having the borrow. So when you when we look at those two cases, which I call uh, it's no op here, no op one and op, uh, the case four and the case one, they are the same code. Essentially the same code. The variable is passed around as a mutable and then it's returned. I take it as a mutable and I, I change, I mutate this. That's it. And when we go to no op five, which I think it's one of the best ones. Now we're not doing even mutation. No op five is the same as no op four. I just pass this around, no mutation whatsoever. But now I use the copy to make a different user. Instead of returning, instead of returning the same variable, I make a different one. No mutation involved. The cool thing is all those functions generate the same assembly. All those functions are equal. We can go to God boat. I go here. I'm going to need to remove, I think, three, which is the bad one. Wasn't it? That? And use variable. Yeah, no, no, no. Can leak private type. Uh, what is the issue here? Do I need to put pub here? Yes, I, that, that was it. Okay. Um, we could look at the, f uh, at the assembly generated. It's not the same. Okay, there is one thing that bothered me. I made the, the examples here. I compiled this in the past. Each function is here. Uh, and one of the things that I find interesting is that no op one, so this function right here and this function right here generate almost the same, same assembly. What are the differences? There is one difference, which is here. You can see that this instruction was moved out of place and that bothered me. Now they're the same, by the way, but it doesn't matter. It's just, you know, it's an accident of the, how the compiler works. It's not an issue. So those two functions, uh, call no op one and call no op five generate the same assembly, even though this looks like this looks like there is an allocation, right? But there is no, there is no allocation here because by having, um, by having linearity, I can guarantee you that immutable code and mutable code behave the same. In fact, if you ignore side effects, if you ignore IO, Rust does not have mutation. Rust is as pure as Haskell. It's actually more pure than Haskell. Because what do we, what is the metric that we use to define if a language is a pure language? It's not if the language uh, allow you to do an assignment. No, no, no. The only thing that we use is if the language preserves uh, referential transparency. So if by having a function and expanding it, does the behavior of the code changes, which is the thing when you have mutation. Uh, so like whenever you have a, a, a mutable function, that is an explosive statement. I know the statement that I'm making. Whenever you have uh, an immutable function, those two cannot be, A and B must be equal. Okay. Uh, that's a guarantee that a pure language gives you. Does Rust gives you that? Yes, it does. You may be like, you oh, know, but I can allocate and, uh, and then do some stuff. Yes, but that's because you're using let mute. If you just remove the sugar, you're going to see that at the end of the day, this function and this function. So the other one, no, not this one. So that function and this function are the same. And this is a pure function, right? There is no mutation happening here. If they are the same, it means that the first one is also an immutable function. Um, and why do I say that it's more pure than Haskell? Because in Haskell, we have the state monad, 
which is bad. Like it's really, really bad. But now I'm going to show how by having this framework of, wait, if I just use a variable only once. Oh, sorry. No, op5 was behind the, the camera. My bad. Yeah. So this function, uh, but that's because you're not using the variable inside inside the hop, inside of no op. No, I am. No, no op one and no op five are doing the same thing. And I can, uh, you may be like, oh, but what if you do a mutation here? Like, what if I do ID equals five? I could do the same here, here, so the same thing here. ID five, a dot name. Now they're still the same code. Still, both codes are mutable. Why? Because when I see this, I don't see, like, you may be looking at a function. You may be reading the type of no op one as a of, uh, where is my immute user? To unit. That's not what I'm seeing. What I'm seeing is this. Because this is sugar to that. And like, I'm not making, I'm not making a, a bold statement here. Like, it is the same. That's the point of board checking. The point of board checking is making linearity accessible. And uh, how do you translate the body of this function? Well, you just use a copy. You just do wit. And so that's why it looks, uh, it looks mutable, but it's not. All the properties are preserved. The same thing here. So if I do that transformation, if I do the transformation of, hey, this is the same as this, now, of course, I need to do this. But uh, yeah, that's about it. It's a mechanical transformation. There is no magic. From the point of view of, sorry, from the point of view of some code, yeah, that's the same. It's just that when you put the annotation here, the immute there, that's the same as saying, hey, this variable is going to be redefined uh, here. That's it. It's sugar. And so that is a very strong property. And uh, let me show you why in general mutation violates. In general mutation violates uh, referential transparency, right? So this is not, not necessarily equal to this. Why? Because I can define a function. Uh, let's say there is a counter here and I'm going to take the counter plus one and return the counter. So when I call F the first time, it's going to return a one. When I call it a second time, it's going to return two. That only happens because the accumulator is using twice, is being used twice. If, if no variable can be used twice, mutation does not violate transfer, uh, referential transparency. In fact, mutation doesn't even need to exist to achieve the performance that you want. But that's only if no variable is being used twice, which is what REST guarantees. And let me show you how you can get a race and still have a pure language. Oh, that's it. There is no mutation happening here. I can even do a race set, right? I can even do like function that is going to set the second element. Uh, so this function is going to set the second element to X. So it copies X to here, and then it returns the array. Uh, actually, let me leave both functions here to avoid. G set X. Array two. That is a pure function. How do I? Why can I use mutation here? Because array zero, I know that I have the only copy of array zero. So if I have the only copy of array zero, array zero cannot be used outside of this function. So I could just mutate it. I could just do array set and return a new one. It looks like I returned a copy of the array, right? Because it looks like this returns a copy. But no, it could be the same. In the, 
And in fact, if you are going to implement this, you're going to implement it to be the same. And this is the main insight that linear types gives you. If you model stuff as resources, you gain a lot of control over them. Um, well, you have that. I, I can do the same here using... I can do the same here using, you know, board checking. Uh, one to X. Both G's do the same. But this one looks like a pure function. This one looks like a completely pure function. I could call this update or wit. But they are not. Well, they are both of them are pure functions. But they are doing mutation. Isn't mutation a side effect? Not necessarily. Mutation is only a side effect if you can observe it, right? It's the same thing of like, uh, you know, if a tree uh, falls in the middle of a forest and no, no one is there to hear it. Did it happen? Not really, at least not externally. Uh, <coughs> and this is the main insight. I, I also want to mention essentially this, uh, having the guarantee of linearity allows you to have immutable code as fast as mutable code. There is no need for a garbage collector. There is no need for, in fact, there is no need, no, no need for even reference counting or anything like that. If every variable is guaranteed to be linear, then you just do malloc and free. That's it. No magic. Um, and that's how I think about linearity. I think about linearity whenever I see this function, I'm like, oh yeah. And the same thing, whenever I see this, I'm like, yeah, this is just redefining Glenda here as another mutable variable. Same thing here. I could go here. Uh, this is a bad borrow, but you know, this one, transform it in a pure function, super easy. This one, also. This one doesn't work. Uh, because this one would allow to break uh, some stuff, to break a referential transparency. But uh, there are some stuff, okay? It's not nearly as simple as that when, whenever you add some stuff. Especially whenever you add branching. Okay? So what is the issue with branching? Let's say I, try, I was trying to, to do this function, but now it has a condition, which is a Boolean. And whenever the Boolean is true, I want to, I want to set one and whenever, uh, otherwise I want to set zero. What is the issue? If I do if pred, uh, array two, well, here I could just do this, right? Actually, I noticed they end up almost the same. Nice. Else? Okay. So this is a problem. Because array one is appear twice. How do we solve that? Well, there is a very easy solution. which is not ergonomics, and here is where board checking is going to help you. Okay, so this returns a function. And I know there is a, an easier transformation. I'm just doing the canonical one. Uh, I do array one and X. And now everything is being used once. This is not an allocation. Notice that this uh, closure does not reference anything outside. So that's okay. That, that would be the same as a risk closure. But now you can see that I do a conditional if, I'm gonna use a pattern matching here to make it easier. Well, at least for me, it's easier to reason about that. 
So if it is true, it does this. If it is false, because functions are first class citizens, right? So array one is being used once. X, uh, I'm gonna call that uh, array two and three and Y and Z, just to make sure everyone can see. Array one is being used once, X is being used once, array two is being used once, Y is being used once, array three is used once, Z is being used once. That's it. There is no uh, break of linearity. And you can, uh, of course, if I, if I show that on, if I show that using borrow checking, it's gonna be much easier because that's one of the main magics that borrow checking gives you. There is also another, another case I know that you could just make this the condition. I know that. Uh, but whenever I, I have borrow checking, I can just do this. And you may be like, but array one is being used twice. No, it's not. Is that this returns a borrow? Like this expression takes array one as mutable only on one side. This is a special expression. That's why having beauty in pattern matching with borrow checking is so important. Because now you can know that, yeah, this variable is being used once on this side and once on that side. And so for sure, this is much more natural for, for, uh, sorry. I could actually even go here, right? Yeah. For sure, this is much more natural for, for C people. But I'm, I'm going to argue that this is better. Because these you need to, to, now you need to have a set of rules on your mind that is much, much bigger. You need to understand that this takes, uh, if this has, if something inside of this expression take, takes a mutable borrow of array, then this entire expression takes a mutable borrow of the array. If this takes a read-only borrow, but this takes a mutable, this takes a mutable. And so now you have all sorts of weird rules that you need to maintain. While this, no weird rule, just normal uh, beta reduction. Every variable is being used once. Um, sure, this is not how I would do it. I would probably do it, um, for, in this case, I would probably do like index pred true one false true, you know. And then just do array set array one x. What is the advantage of this though? The advantage of this is that you can always move the code. I can always move this. I can take this, put it, call it uh, left, call this right. Now I have left and right. And now it's already not that bad. And I can even do funk. can call it update. Sure. And why can I do all those transformations? Because I have a guarantee that there is no mutation. Those are natural transformations that you can do if you have a pure language. You cannot do it here. I cannot do left, right. That is not gonna do the same thing that you think it's gonna do. Because now there is mutation happening. And it, it, it becomes very clear when you add here, right? Because now you're saying, yeah, yeah, it's passing the, the copies around and whatnot. Um, and then, so like uh, left is not going to work the way that I think it's going to work. Because this is an array. And so all of this, it's, it's much more clear if you only, if you only use the pure version. And I'm going to make a, an even stronger argument. Most code should be immutable, okay? At all. Most code should not rely on mutation. And 
A very good incentive for that is making code that relies on mutation to look, look ugly. This looks ugly. It just does. And sure, you can have special cases and whatnot, but even this line already looks ugly. This looks ugly. Sorry, this should be a ratio. Why is that okay? Wait, isn't that my... No, no, no. I changed the wrong function. Here. Why is that okay? Because you should not be using arrays for everything. You shouldn't. You should think about it. And this makes you think about it. This makes, makes you think about it in the same way that the bore checker does. But the problem of the bore checker is that it's like you have three different systems, right? You have your language, you have your type system, and then you have your bore checking. I don't think that that makes a lot of sense. I already, like, I think separ separating the language from the bore checking makes sense, but like, uh, from the type system, but like, separating the type system from the bore checking, that's kind of weird. For me, this, like, doing this is, is a type error. It's not a borrow checking error. No, it's a type error. Like, ar array has a type that requires it to be used once. It failed. Some of the properties of array were not maintained. That's no different from calling a function that expects an int with a string. Types are not, types are not only structural. Types may be substructural, which is what a linear type is. And that is very important. And I think for me, that's also what is, got, what is making the next generation of programming languages. I think Rust is the first su successful next generation of languages. Because the next generation of languages is going to be linear. It may, be, it may have a bunch of features more, but it's definitely going to be linear. Um, there is a, a programming language researcher called Philip Wadler. He's a very important computer science scientist. He also dresses himself as the Lambda Man. So you can see him dressed as the Lambda Man sometimes. Uh, and he made a paper which, he, which is called Linear Types Can Change the World. And maybe if I go to, I always lose the PDF for this. There is a slide, but that's not what I'm looking for. Uh, PDF. Yeah, where is my PDF? Google Scholars. Here. So Wadler in, which year was this? Do we have the year? In 90. So like 33 years ago, he published this paper saying, hey, linear types can change the word. Uh, I think he was right. Not only I think uh, linear types can change the word. I think linear types did change the word. I think Rust is like the next gen of programming languages. Rust is such a huge improvement. Uh, Rust, Rust ha has the potential to be faster than C. In fact, in some transformations, it's, it already is. It's just that, you know, Rust people and C people have different uh, priorities. But like, Rust is an improvement. It's a major, major improvement. And I think Mr. Waddler was correct. Uh, and so that's kind of all that there is to it. Uh, board checking, linear types, uh, Rust being a pure language. Rust is not a pure language, it does has I.O. But like, if you're not doing I.O., Rust is a pure language. If you're using a monad, uh, if you're using async for stuff, Rust is a pure language. More than Haskell. Sure, as soon as you do, as soon as you do like side effects, but Haskell also has some forms of side effect. So don't, don't, don't pay that much attention to it. But yeah, that's, that's for me, a very, very important, important thing, which is 
Linearity is changing. Linearity uh, is going to make stuff better. And I think there is more room. Uh, there is room for more stuff. Uh, I think the natural improvement of linear systems are for them to be reference counted. So Rust has it, right? In Rust, you can do a reference counting because not being able to do x plus x is really annoying. But if you do have a reference counting, you can do x plus x. You just need to say that this function, uh, uh, that this int uses two copies. And now we have a reference counter. Sure, it can even be inferred, I would say, right? But that's, that's like next-gen stuff. And I really think we're going to have a functional language that is not going to have a garbage collector. Um, and it's going to be a linear language with reference counting by default. A reference counting can be done in even more ways. One second. In fact, for most cases, let's say you had uh, double, right, right, which is this function. I could still have a function that takes, that does double. So this is going to be two copies and I'm going to return. So I could still have a function that does double of, I don't know, one. Can I do double of A? I can. Yeah. So let's say this was true. Why? Because this is going to apply the function twice. I can say that this is int 4. So it's the same as if I had applied the function twice. So now, uh, now I had, uh, sorry. Let's say here. If I need two copies here, and I'm using two copies here, how many copies of X I need? I need four. That's very natural. This can be inferred. No reference counting is needed here. No garbage collection. Even if this was boxed, I can just know and make the copies ahead of time. That's about it. Um, and because, one second. And because you have this, there are even more tricks. You can still say, uh, for example, let's say now you want something that can only be used once, like a socket. Yeah, you could have a simple modifier saying, hey, a socket can only be used once. I don't think it's, it comes with a cost of complexity. I think it comes with an explicit cost of com complexity. Linearity is not a problem. Uh, linearity is a problem for all languages. This is a behavior that all languages have. Like resource management is there. Like uh, OCaml and JavaScript implement a garbage collector. That's exactly what it's trying to do. It's just that instead of the language doing that for you, it's giving you on your hand and saying, hey, do that. That's the same thing on C. On C it's worse, right? Because now you need to manage by hand and you do not have any tooling helping you. And you may be like, oh no, but I know what I'm doing. Yes, but you need to prove to the tool. Otherwise, well, you may be wrong. The good thing about having this is that you have a guarantee. You have a proof that your system uh, holds some properties. I, I'm really excited for this, uh, for the uh, multiplicative linear types, which also goes on graded model dependent type theory. It's a very good paper by uh, Dominique Orchard. He's the supervisor of a friend of mine also. So I think we're, we have space for more. I think we have space for way better stuff. Um, and I think that's going to save so much. Like that's not only going to save us from mutation and side effects, but I think that's also going to save us on parallelism. If you have linear stuff, doing parallelism is very easy. You can, you can have a read-only copy, you send a read-only copy to different branches. Uh, and so that's what I think it's important. Uh, I believe this is going to change the world even further. I think the next language, uh, it's not only going to be... 
I think all the next languages are going to need to have uh, linearity in some form. And that, that means functional languages, non-functional languages. That means dependent type languages. That's about the case. I think linear types are changing the word. And even better, I think linear types uh, change the word. That was it. It's like some stuff you need to think about, about it yourself. But I hope you all got something. Just think it about it in terms of resources. Think about it in terms of variables, modeling resources. Uh, and so, yeah, that's about it. Uh, I'm going to stop recording.